गुड आफ्टरनून बट सर सर यह माइक इज म्यूटेड सर गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून मार्श गुड आफ्टरनून सर सर नमस्कार गुड आफ्टरनून सर नमस्कार हस वर्ष हार्दिक शुभाशय सर नमस्कार 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 सर नेवर मेन वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक टुडे Do you remember me, but sir? Yes, yes sir. I I know you very well. Thank you for being. I am I am participating every seminar. You know, I see you okay. every every time. I see okay, you. sir. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And I remember meeting you those days. You know, when I came there. Ah. Uh, what is that on the law? What is that on the card? Little one. Ah, I am card. No, play that. Do you understand? But Mike is muted. Maybe he is a today passive participant today. What is my cousin Alvin? Sir, it's my mother. Mother's account, so I can't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Hope I am not late. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Uh-huh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Hello, sir. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Hi, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello, sir. Hi. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, can I start or can I wait for two more minutes? Ah. Uh, okay, sir. Sure. Sir. So, uh, one good afternoon to one and all. Uh, welcome to UL Space Co webinar session 43. Uh, we know that uh, we are on the 43rd session of UL Space Co webinar series, which has started in uh, May 2020, uh, and we are very happy to welcome all uh, participants and other uh, ISRO veterans and uh, our chief speaker to this uh, webinar session. So uh, before going to the introduction of the session, uh, this is the first program uh, of UL Space Code in 2022. Uh, so uh, wishing you a happy 2022 and uh, a, a great prosperous year ahead uh, to all. Uh, we hope that uh, UL Space Club can coordinate and conduct a few more interesting programs for all the followers of UL Space Club uh, related to space science, technology, and uh, space application, etc. Uh, so uh, again, uh, when talking about the webinar series, uh, we are on the forty-third session. We just started our uh, webinar series on May twenty twenty uh, as a uh, when we were struck due to the COVID pandemic issue. Uh, we were unable to conduct uh, our offline programs uh, like space camps and other pro- uh, sessions. So we just started thinking about the webinar series, and uh, we could uh, contact uh, Dr. Jayan Moti from Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and he I uh, was. Uh, He helped us uh, to conduct a webinar session, and uh, from the uh, we could successfully complete forty-two sessions. And on this forty-third uh, session, we uh, we have an interesting topic, a uh, very relevant topic, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, you all of you may aware of uh, this uh, specific topic, special topic. And uh, we have an uh, expert uh, in astrophysics with us. Uh, our today's topic is about a James Webb Telescope. Uh, it, it's uh, one of the most important topic in space science uh, for a few years uh, because it's a uh, most anticipated project uh, most anticipated space mission uh, during uh, for uh, last 4 to 5 years uh, because uh, it, 
it is uh, considered as the uh, second stage of a hubble space telescope uh, because it's a continuation of uh, what hubble space uh, telescope has done uh, so uh, james webb telescope uh, lot uh, the whole world is expecting uh, more and more uh, information uh, and uh, research details from james webb telescope and it's uh, beca has become a interesting topic among the uh, space aspirants so uh, today we are going to discuss about the uh, specific uh, specifications of james webb telescopes and uh, the mission objectives and all that things uh, so uh, for that uh, we have uh, dr joy jacob from astronomical society of india uh with us uh i'm not going to detail the introduction of our chief speaker because shadil sir is here for that uh before that uh, i just want to uh before going to the session on uh, before going to shadil sir i just want to mention few more things that uh we will have a question and answer session uh the speaker will uh do his presentation and uh, after the comments from experts we will have a question and answer session for students uh we have a chat window uh, here in google meet so all of you can type your questions in the chat window uh you will space club uh, student panel members will collect your questions for the question and answer session uh you can ask your questions in the chat window and it will be selected to the question and answer session uh you may get a chance to ask the question directly to the speaker so uh, use the chat window in a very good way and uh, we will have a quiz uh, related to space telescopes uh, after this uh, webinar session and the discussion uh, after what of thanks uh, we will post a quiz link a google form link in the chat window uh, you can access that uh, google form link and you can uh, participate in ul space club quiz 43 uh, so uh, there will be a prize uh, for uh, first uh, prize winner uh, from ul space club and uh, sindhavan nature so uh, please try to participate uh, i request all participants to uh, participate in the ul space club quiz as well as the webinar session uh, so uh, before going to the uh, next uh, shell sir uh, one more instruction i have uh, that's especially for students uh, all students are requested to uh, keep the guidelines by ul space club uh, coordination team uh, all of you are requested to switch off your camera and mic throughout the uh, presentation because otherwise it will be an interruption to other participants when they are listening to uh, our chief speaker and his presentation so uh, uh, one more thing is you don't please don't try to share your screen uh, when you, uh, you you are sharing your screen uh, while the speaker is uh, sharing his slides it will be an interruption to our youtube streaming and also it will be an interruption to uh, all participants when they are uh, uh, observing the slides of our speaker so please don't try to share your screen and please uh, switch on uh, switch off your mic and camera uh, throughout the session unless you are asked to switch on it and uh, that uh, please uh, keep the uh, guidelines uh, throughout the session and uh, once again welcome all of uh, all of you welcome to ul space club webinar session 43 and uh, let's have a wonderful discussion without any delay let me move on to shail sir for introducing our chief guest shail sir
thank you sajeev sir hope i am audible and also thank you varun and i am really honored by the presence of uh, luminaries from our uh, space uh, uh, science department especially i am honored by the presence of uh, former director kutti sir and uh, other famous scientists from isro also i am very happy that my close friend nikhil also is attending i was not knowing that he will be present hi <laughs> nikhil so very happy to have you also on board and also i know there are many senior people in the audience but uh, i have designed this lecture for uh, the students or the children so i may not have much for the senior people but anyway i am really happy that uh, all of them are around to guide me um, and also to correct me if i am doing any uh, telling anything uh, any uh, if the, if at all there are any errors so when uh, i i i first of all would like to thank the space club and uh, shajil sir for inviting me for this program i happened to know about uh, the activities of space club from nikhil uh, many months back and was looking forward to an occasion for uh, uh, for uh, addressing the students of the club and i'm very happy that i'm able to do it now and i have also promised rajil sir to get associated with the activities of this uh, club in further and i love very much to talk to children so with this words uh, let me start with my presentation i hope my screen is uh, visible okay yeah thank you so i'll be talking on the james webb telescope and uh, thereafter my title is uh, like this and uh, i thought of thought of talking to the students about this since this is the latest breaking news in the world of astrophysics and also i put the title like uh, james webb telescope and thereafter since there is going to be a division so to say in the history of a uh, development of the knowledge of uh, knowledge in uh, astrophysics so maybe people may be telling like this was before james webb telescope and uh, after so much of uh, development has happened the same thing was right for a uh, hubble space telescope also as you all will remember so that's why i chose this title so uh, let us uh, start with uh, some introduction like uh, every webinar or a seminar is starting started with so in the introduction i'll be just briefly since uh, we are having uh, children as our audience major audience i'll be just brushing through some of the very rudimentary aspects uh, regarding space and then we will go on to the discussion of the hubble space telescope most of you may be aware of or maybe may, might have uh, seen the videos on the launching as well as the deployment schedule of uh, the uh, the various uh, instruments uh, on the james webb telescope so i have mostly avoided uh, much description on that but we'll be discussing uh, the essential uh, components of the james webb telescope briefly and then we'll be going into uh, finally going into the uh, the thereafter section so to say thereafter means the science cases what will come into uh, what will be added on to astrophysics after the james webb telescope is operational and you all know that it will it will be a while maybe a few months since uh, uh, when the james webb telescope will be sending us the first images but uh, we are all anticipating very good uh, performance for the james webb telescope for the forthcoming 5 to 10 years so i just prefer to start my webinars by just starting from where we are so this is just the a pictorial representation of the earth we live in and the matter which i have represented in the text is all known to you so there is no need of a, no need of explaining anything but we are the life forms so the maybe the most uh, having the most developed uh, not maybe the most developed brains are uh, of us and uh, that is the reason why we are able to ponder into the vastness of the universe so we are we all know that uh, we see uh, we are, we, even if you see the animals around us they are not 
having any awareness that they are in a planet and the planet is revolving around the sun and the sun is uh, among the numerous um, stars in the galaxy and all, all this information is currently known only to human beings on the surface of the earth. But we don't know whether this information are there for other living uh, living beings and maybe existing in some other exoplanets. So the Hubble Space Telescope may be able to tell us. It may not be able to tell us whether there, is, there are life forms, but may be able to tell us whether there are conditions for life in exoplanets. That is one of the important science goals of a James Webb Telescope. So we will be coming across all these aspects in, uh, towards the end of this uh, lecture. But I just wanted to mention to you that we are, uh, we, are uh, we being the uh, the the maybe the super brains on the surface of the earth we are able to uh, understand what the universe is all about so i am just coming to the next slide where uh, uh, just we are thinking about what is sky so this is for children not for the senior people so is it really up there so we know that maybe many of uh, my uh, children audience will be child audience will be under, uh, will be knowing that there is no sky there is something called the sky over there it is an illusion the sky the blue sky which we see with the clouds and all white clouds and all these are all uh, illusions to us because of the scattering of uh, light so the science students may be much aware of uh, the scattering and the related laws and all but anyway for a layman's, uh, in, the, in a layman's point of view, if you look up, we will see some somewhat uh, hemisphere like this. And uh, we call it the sky. The sky appears to be a huge blue umbrella. Which is, uh, this blue umbrella is uh, in uh, uh, astronomy terms, it is called the celestial sphere. The sun, moon, the stars, all are seen to stuck on this umbrella. And it is also moving, not exactly stuck, but it is moving. As time goes on, these objects are seen to move in the sky. So there are certain uh, specific uh, nomenclature for these points, etc. The, there is celestial uh, equator, zenith, uh, meridian, north celestial pole, south celestial pole, etc. Which most possibly will be known to my audience, I suppose. And uh, this particular illusion of the sky has made it easy for the astronomers to pinpoint uh, an object in the sky. So what do we uh, what do we see uh, on the surface of the sky, the imaginary sky? We see stars and we see the planets. We see maybe comets, uh, asteroids, or uh, maybe um, we are also able to see a few galaxies, uh, maybe one or two galaxies also. Um, stars are the major components which we see on the surface of the sky, and we know that stars are much far away. The position of objects in sky can be denoted by extending the latitude and longitude onto the imaginary sky. I told you that the sky is imaginary and we uh, uh, in our geography classes have uh, understood how a place on the surface of the earth can be denoted by drawing longitudes and latitudes. So if we, if we expand that longitude and latitude onto the imaginary sky, the blue sky, or the white sky, so to say, <laughs> so then we will have all these lines drawn across this uh, sky and then with regard to those lines we can represent the position of an object which is on the sky so for that we use a, a construction like this so you all know that the earth is having an inclination and because of the inclin inclination of the earth in, uh, in the plane of uh, this uh, in the orbit the we can see the sun to be like uh, to be uh, overhead at the various points like this on the sky. So this is called a, uh, this is called the, this uh, ecliptic. So there is this ecliptic movement. So this ecliptic movement, uh, this full uh, circle will be available only during the course of one year. And also we are denoted the maybe the positions in the sky where the sun is. Uh, and uh, the, as I mentioned to you, this uh, longitude, latitude, as well as equator is uh, expanded onto the sky. And this equator will cut this uh, ecliptic like this. And this point is very 
important in a, in a, uh, in uh, denoting a particular object in the sky we are having this as somewhat as the origin of uh, this longitude uh, this uh, uh, the sky longitude latitude diagram see the, the graph or uh, the diagram so this is the origin and from here the position of a uh, say a particular star over here can be denoted by denoting the right ascension and the declination like what we, how we uh, denote some position on the surface of the earth so i just wanted to mention to you some of you may be already knowing that the position of an astronomical object is given by right ascension which is almost equivalent to the longitude in, on the surface of the earth and uh, declination which is almost uh, the equivalent uh, concept of uh, uh, the latitude so the ra right ascension and declination are uh, the two parameters which are required to pinpoint one object on the sky okay so this is just to mention this is not that important everybody knows this but just wanted to mention it to you the actual motions in the sky is different from what we see so this was why the earlier human beings were uh, were um, misguided by the motions of the uh, the heavenly bodies the sun moon were seen to be moving across the sky but it was not actually like that and that is why they were misguided to how the 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 um geocentric model of the universe and later on it was corrected on to the uh, to the heliocentric model of the universe all this uh, history regarding the understanding of the universe might be known to you i just mentioned to you that uh, the we observe the motions of the objects in the sky related to the motion of the planet earth we live in so we learn to correct for the relative uh, correct for the motion of our planet in order to understand in real how the motions are happening that is the just the point which i wanted to convey to you okay now we are going we are going into the next slide where i will be discussing about the various messengers from the universe so the word messenger itself means that uh, somebody who carries uh, some news or uh, uh, maybe some information so insight about the universe is obtained from the inherently complementary information carried by these agencies photons can carry information gravitational waves can carry information from a far away object neutrinos can bring in some of the information from very far away astronomical objects cosmic rays also can play a, an important role in uh, doing so so these are currently known four messengers from the universe photons gravitational waves neutrinos and cosmic rays now these are all complementary means one can supplement add something to what the other messenger is bringing in so nowadays very recently there is this uh, this uh, term which is called multi messenger astrophysics wherein we will be using information from brought in by gravitational waves together with information brought in by photons that is electromagnetic waves and maybe using both to represent the astrophysical phenomena in a very uh, in a better way and that has happened uh, when uh, the electromagnetic counterparts of uh, the merger of uh, neutron stars as well as black holes uh, were detected by the the gravitational wave detectors i hope you might have had another webinar earlier regarding the gravitational waves and all so there are these high energy neutrinos and uh, the cosmic rays of which uh, the scientific world is uh, uh, it, it it was it is not that used to get the messages as the gravitational waves and the photons are used so gravitational waves from merging stellar mass black hole and neutron star binaries have been detected at frequencies 10 hertz to 1 kilohertz range with the laser interferometric gravitational wave detectors until then the major messenger from the universe was the electromagnetic waves or the photons but now we have at least two major messengers gravitational waves and photons and it will be in further due course of time when developments in the field of neutrino astronomy and cosmic rays uh, happens then we will have four different messengers from the universe so the take home point is that we have four messengers which are able to provide us with information from the universe one is electromagnetic waves I, i denoted here as photons because uh, electromagnetic waves are uh, uh, the the photons are uh, manifestations of electromagnetic waves so uh, for, uh, electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves neutrinos and cosmic rays are the four messengers from the universe which will provide us with a uh, valuable information from what is happening in the universe in the various parts of the universe electromagnetic waves are the major messengers from the universe 
information from cosmos mainly are available through electromagnetic radiations originating and propagating from the objects and depending of the condition at which this particular uh, particular object is electromagnetic radiations of a various frequencies may be emitted by the particular object and by deciphering the electromagnetic radiation one will be able to say what is happening inside or uh, uh, in connection with that particular object so this has been the earlier method of uh, understanding the universe maybe the only uh, method to for understanding the universe which was added on to recently by gravitational waves maybe uh, at 2014 onwards you might be knowing that the first detection of gravitational waves did take place in 2014 and we have an expert in that field uh, um, nikhil mukund with us he was also a part of uh, the discovery of the first ever gravitational waves from the universe as you may be knowing so maybe in the during the discussion you can ask more about this to him so information such as distance temperature chemical composition density magnetic fields the various physical phenomena the environment and a lot many other uh, information of a celestial body can be obtained from the analysis of electromagnetic radiations see similar information or a, or a, or a parallel information is also available through gravitational waves but gravitational waves currently are detected Uh, uh, gravitational waves are detected from usually uh, in the in the current scenario only from collision of objects so in order to gravitational uh, uh, waves to be detectable there should be collision between neutron stars or between uh, black holes etc so for a uh, for a an object which is existing peacefully we may not be able to get a detectable amo amount of uh, gravitational waves so for from such objects we may get uh, the uh, electromagnetic radiations okay so there is no need for explaining this to you this is just the depiction of a dispersion of light uh, which uh, we you, all the children will know that the vibrio or the different colors which is present in the sunlight and why am i uh, flashing this uh, ppt just to tell you about the electromagnetic spectrum so you we already told that the sunlight uh, the visible light which is available on the surface of the earth is a uh, Uh, is uh, uh, having a wavelength from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer so this visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum is ob we observe uh, will be occupying only this and there is a lot of uh, invisible radiations infrared radio waves x rays ultraviolet and gamma rays these are all electromagnetic radiations and we should understand that even though we are able to see by our naked eye this uh, this uh, visible radiation there are there are also emission of uh, radiations like gamma rays x rays ultraviolet infrared and radio waves from objects which will not be seen through an optical telescope so we are uh, coming into the discussion of that again so this is just a view graph of a uh, comparison of the wavelength of the various uh, uh, the various uh, electromagnetic wave uh, bands with the usually uh, known uh, or usually understood uh, um, objects or uh, entities like uh, buildings so we can say that this gamma rays will be having the wavelength of the order of atomic nuclei while radio waves will be having the size of uh, buildings so hopefully you children will be under, uh, already knowing about the wavelength and the frequency of a wave etc so no need to tell about that i suppose so these are all uh, uh, just flashed in order to you to have a, a continuation or a connection with the, what we are going to discuss so now i am coming into the discussion of the atmospheric window the atmospheric window tells us or gives us an idea about of all the radiations i told you that uh, all these uh, kinds of different radiation radiations uh, electromagnetic radiations can be emitted by astronomical object and our sun our uh, our um, the uh, star sun also will be emitting all of this but all of this radiation or the an astronomical object will be uh, capable of uh, emitting in various uh, wavelengths but all of this may not reach the surface of the earth because of the presence of atmosphere atmosphere is very crucial for our life so we cannot curse the atmosphere <laughs> but uh, we we will have to amend for uh, what is being lost so ground based observations are possible only for optical radio and some range of infrared radiations so that is depicted here see the visible light is reaching the observatory which is placed on a hill top and the radio waves are re received by the radio telescopes even in the planes infrared rays some of them can reach the others cannot reach ultraviolet x rays and gamma rays cannot reach so earlier astronomy earlier before this advent of space astro astronomy 
there was uh, there, there was no no way in which uh, one could uh, get uh, the infrared x rays and gamma rays but still uh, scientists were able to try out by uh, by flying balloons and all but later uh, there are further development which we will be just discussing for all, all other wavelengths we require observations from space so this is another depiction of the atmospheric window all these uh, gamma ray x rays ultraviolet etc em emitted by the astronomical objects can be only detected from space so we can very well understand why this part of the astronomy was not uh, not pursued earlier maybe before 1950s because we all know that after only after 1950s the satellite technology did mature enough to send probes to or they send the uh, vehicles to uh, space so after 1950 the satellites were also used for a uh, making observation of astronomical objects from space so as to get information on uh, on the objects uh, in these wavelengths also so here also the radio is uh, uh, is obtainable on the surface and the uh, visible radiation also is uh, uh, observable on the surface maybe a little on the higher mountains etc okay so coming on to the observation since we discussed about observations let us uh, say have uh, devote a few slides to observations you all know this person is uh, none other than galileo galilei and uh, as it is usually uh, taught or uh, maybe uh, written in some books he is not the person who who invented the telescope he is the person who just who is the first person who looked to the sky using the telescope this telescope uh, as far as history the, the telescope is uh, initially made by a person uh, by name lipperche who was a who was a, um, uh, a spectacle dealer um galileo happened to see this telescope and he is the first person who ventured to look at the sky and uh, understand the sky using this telescope this is the the original telescope which was used to by uh, galileo which is kept in a museum so galileo's observations were capable of adding much to what was observed through naked eye that was a quantum leap in the in understanding the universe and uh, it is need, uh, need needless to say here that science itself has got all this latest information through mostly through instruments nano science you might have heard about and also about uh, all these uh, distant galaxies um, uh, galaxy clusters etc all these are possible because of instruments one kind or another telescope is an instrument microscope is another instrument and nowadays we cannot think about the developments in science without instruments so making instruments is a very important aspect of a astrophysics nowadays and also all the sciences so james webb telescope is actually an instrument it is an instrument for for understanding the universe better and there is lots of a lot of um, a lot of effort which is going into making an instrument and also there is a branch which is called astronomy instrumentation mostly engineers work there so usually some uh, 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 engineering students who are fond of science used to ask so can we engineering students do something in science i was interested in science but i was pushed to engineering by my parents so i used to say okay you are the most suited persons to work in astrophysics like uh, uh, subjects science subjects so that you can build uh, new and new instruments and uh, supplement uh, to the information which is available about the universe so this is uh, uh, the, 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 this is one such instrument and uh, what we are seeing is the beginning of a new era with the uh, on of looking into the sky and understanding the sky using telescopes so what the instrument telescope showed galileo i will not be flashing this ppt for much of time because this is all uh, information which you can collect i just wanted to present here if at all there are some children who doesn't know about this what all information new information did galileo get by looking through his telescope then all these information are available in the internet so he could get a better uh, and a better vision of the moon and he saw these craters etc on the surface of the moon he did uh, visualize the four satellites of uh, jupiter which were not visible by the the naked eye and the most important of his uh, observation was the faces of venus so the venus was found to have faces and uh, with this he could very well support the copernican theory of a heliocentric model of the universe this is one of the major achievements of uh, the first observation of the sky using the telescope and then he could uh, visualize the the appendages of the saturn and also this is also another important aspect the milky way the which is a white kind of a patch which was seen on the surface of the sky and people were not knowing what it was 
Galileo could understand that that is uh, the closely associated uh, or a, a clo closely uh, a position, not closely positioned actually. It is a um, illusion that it is closely positioned. Those are all very far away. But this is a conglomeration of stars which is a part of our galaxy. So much, much information did uh, trickle in from his observation of the sky. I just um, flashing this uh, PPT which tells you about uh, one another uh, great development in the field of uh, telescope, the early development. Uh, there are many uh, versions of the telescopes which we can talk on maybe for many, maybe an hour or so. But I have just chose this, chose, uh, uh, I choose this because uh, this gentleman, uh, uh, Herschel, it mapped the Milky Way galaxy in 1785. And his Milky Way galaxy map was somewhat like this. We know that this is not the actual shape of the galaxy, but this somewhat crudely uh, uh, depicts uh, our galaxy. These are all positions of the stars. And also using this telescope, he could uh, discover the Uranus in 1781. Uranus is not visible to the naked eye, you know. And also he made a catalog using this telescope. So this was very crucial for the development. Just I'm just jumping into the uh, the to, uh, to show you the biggest of the telescopes in the or the world's largest telescope. This is in La Palma Canary Islands, and it is at, in a hill which is at 2,267 meters, and the mirror diameter is at 10.4 meters. So such a mirror of 10.4 meters wide cannot be singly made. So it is actually uh, uh, actually made out of many mirrors which are put together in a specific fashion in order to have a very smooth spherical surface. So this is uh, the picture of the uh, the the mirror, but we are I didn't get a picture from the other side. So this is a huge structure uh, having 10.4 meters of uh, diameter, uh, and uh, this is capable of uh, uh, the, this is capable of bringing in much information in the optical uh, uh, optical uh, wavelength. Uh, the biggest telescope which is existing. It can be used to explore uh, planetary system, galaxies, nebulae, etc. So I have missed a lot of information. There are lots of telescopes very near to this and all. I didn't uh, bring in it bring it here because that is not our uh, subject matter. Now I just just want to show you. Where, since I, I I told you about the telescope, this is the Devastal telescope. is the biggest Indian optical telescope, um, which is in Devastal, which is near to Nainital. Uh, no more information, even though many information is copied here. These are all from net, which you can go and look into, because being Indians, we should understand what all are our capabilities. And in that footing, I have also put this side over here and uh, uh, about this uh, uh, revered scientist, uh, the Professor Govind Sodhub, who left us during uh, last year, September last year. I have met him personally, talked to him, and he is the, uh, he is the architect of uh, this uh, giant meter radio telescope, which is a world-class radio telescope in India. So I just thought children should know this. That's why I flashed this as a part of the introduction. Now, I, beyond the window, if you go into the era of space telescopes, it is necessary to go into space to make observations in other wavelengths. I have already mentioned it to you. So the growth of multi-wavelength astronomy is in fact correlated with the enhancement of space technology. This idea also I have mentioned to you. That is why this multi-wavelength astronomy was not possible before 1950s. A lot of satellite telescopes are providing multi-wavelength data to the astronomy community. And this uh, uh, what, uh, speciality of uh, astronomy science, uh, astronomical science is that anybody can get access to the data after a proprietary period of one year. So if some of you want to work on Hubble Space Telescope data, then if Hubble is making an observation now, then after one year it will be open to you. Even students or anybody, any you layman, anybody can download it and use for their purpose. Only if they publish a paper, then they, they will have to just uh, acknowledge. That's the only thing. Okay. This is true with all the telescopes. So this is just uh, a view graph from uh, NASA, just to show you which all telescopes. Not all the telescopes are included here, but some of the ground telescope and some of the... This is, uh, uh, as you can understand, this is not to the scale because uh, this is... Uh, the, this is supposed to be the surface of the Earth, and uh, on the surface of the Earth, there are these big telescopes, which is a, which are the Keck telescope, which is almost 10 meter uh, diameter mirror, Gemini telescope, Karma, Green Bang is a radio telescope. So, uh, under radio, we have put it here. Sophia is a, a flying uh, telescope, which is in infrared. Karma is in a microwave region. In the visible region, we have Keck and Salt. And uh, in the X ray gamma ray, we do not have much of the surface uh, telescope. Most of them are, this is also. Uh, HES is a telescope which can detect secondary radiations, not directly the radiation which is meant for. So the Fermi 
Swift, New Star, Chandra, Galax, Kepler, Hubble, Spitzer, all these are space telescopes. And out of this, in the visible, we have Hubble. In the infrared, we have a Spitzer. These are all by NASA. And uh, we are all telling about uh, space telescopes, telescopes which are uh, uh, which are by uh, by space agencies uh, abroad. But uh, um, we will be coming across uh, one of such telescopes by us. Before that, I am just mentioning a few points regarding the optical space telescope. This is the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one of the greatest successful missions of NASA. And uh, it has got a primary mirror of 2.4 meter diameter. And it is uh, going around the Earth uh, at a height of around 560 kilometers uh, near Earth orbit. Hubble is a type of telescope known as Cassegrain reflector, and it has uh, brought in loads and loads of scientific articles, uh, brought in uh, scientific information, which was published as articles. And the major achievement is that the Hubble has revealed the age of the universe to be about 13 to, or 13.8 billion years, uh, to be precise. Before Hubble, it was not known exactly, but Hubble could uh, pinpoint this uh, information. And just one more slide regarding what are the very important uh, uh, observations of uh, Hubble. Uh, why am I talking about Hubble? Because uh, we are going to talk about James Webb Telescope and mostly we will compare it with the Hubble Space Telescope. So you just need to know a bit of uh, Hubble Space Telescope also. So I have already told you that uh, this uh, Hubble Space Telescope helped to pin down the age of the universe to be 13.8 billion years. And then it discovered the two moons of Pluto, Nix and Hydra. This is the picture of that. And then discovered the nearly a very major galaxy is angered by a black hole at the center. You might know about the supermassive black hole. The idea of the supermassive black hole at the center of uh, most of the galaxies was uh, fixed up or, uh, or, or it was, uh, it was uh, conclusively told by or uh, conclusively established by Hubble. And it created a 3D map of the dark matter. And uh, in the popular side, uh, it captured the Schumacher-Levy-Jupiter collision or impact in 1994. This is a picture of that. And lots of uh, information from the Hubble are also given to the uh, interest of the public. This is, all, this is a, a, a very uh, interesting or a spectacular um, mapping of an impact of a planet by a comet, which was possible only due to uh, Hubble. So such... Uh, incidents or events also are of much interest to the uh, the common people. So Hubble has also brought in many, many information which are also uh, digestible for the common public. Okay. So I mentioned to you that uh, having said all, about all the uh, space telescopes, I should also tell you about Astrosat, the Indian multi telescope, which is still operational. And one of these uh, these uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, telescope is not functioning now, if I remember correctly, or, or all of this uh, X-ray telescopes, etc., are working fine. And uh, many researchers are doing research from the data which is uh, uh, observed, which is obtained from uh, Astrosat. I'm not going into the details. And uh, as you all know, we have uh, people from ISRO here. Though this is uh, the ISRO site which uh, which discusses about Astrosat, and uh, the uh, ISRO uh, the uh, was a major. Uh, uh, what you call a uh, major contributor to building this uh, Astrosat uh, satellite and uh, uh, satellite telescope and launching it. So if uh, you children, if you want more information, you can get it from here. I'm just telling you, you should get more information because this is our own uh, space telescope and we are in the era of space telescopes and now we are planning many, many space telescopes. And uh, you uh, children, when you go, grow up, you will get data from Indian space telescopes more. Now there is a data from Indian Space Telescope Astrosat. You will get more and more Indian Space Telescopes up there, and you'll get data to work on if you are a, uh, if you are uh, opting for uh, astronomy. Now, just uh, a few points about the multi-wavelength observations. Multi-messenger. Uh, I already uh, told you about that uh, terminology. Now, what is multi-wavelength observations? As we have seen, uh, objects, astronomical objects, are capable of uh, emitting in uh, various wavelengths, even in electromagnetic uh, waves. And uh, yeah, we can uh, get uh, complete information about an object only if we are able to decipher the data or the information on various wavelengths. So when we get the information from uh, information from an object through uh, 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 aired or uh, radiated through various uh, wavelengths by using various telescopes, then we say that we have got multi-wavelength observations. This uh, uh, Astrosat is actually a multi-wavelength telescope. 
Astronomers use telescopes with detection devices that are sensitive to wavelengths other than visible light also. Different wavelengths reveal the various physical properties like temperature, color composition, etc. of an object. And I just, uh, um, in order to show you how uh, same entity will differ in observation. If you look at that, look at it uh, with, uh, with different uh, uh, wavelengths, I'm just uh, flashing this uh, uh, this uh, image. So this is the the this is the image of the Milky Way galaxy in various wavelengths. So there can be a very intelligent question: How can we see this galaxy in radio? We cannot see, but this is a map of the radio. By radio telescopes can see, and we can draw a map depending upon the variation in the intensity. And uh, this is such a map. So what we can see is uh, directly see is this on optical only. This is optical. See, so look at this. I just want to, uh, you can just uh, see this picture and I just want to mention one single point over here. See the optical image of the Milky Way galaxy. You can very well see here something, some dark portions over here, no? Does it mean that the center of our Milky Way galaxy is uh, having the word of any stars? No, not at all. So there lies the power of infrared. If you look at the galaxy using infrared, see the central portions wherever the optical light is uh, not there, it is shining bright in shining bright in infrared. The reason is why these uh, dark bands are here is because there is a lot of dust, stellar dust over here at the center, and the stellar dust will absorb the optical radiations coming from the stars, and therefore it looks like uh, uh, opaque portions. So those portions will get lit up when we look at it in, in infrared, since the dust is capable of emitting in infrared when it is heated up by the optical radiations. So this will tell you the importance of a multi-wavelength observations. And also this will tell you the importance of the infrared telescope, which is the James Webb telescope is an infrared telescope. So with these words, I, I just want to go to the next slide, just to flash a few, uh, uh, the, 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 the images of a few objects in various wavelengths. See, this is a galaxy, 3C348, which is given in radio, X-ray and optical. So this is a X-ray and this is radio and optical you can see at the center. So the same galaxy will look differently if you are looking at it in different wavelengths. So the multi-wavelength observations are always essential in order to understand an object to its uh, fullness. So another example is here in this particular portion, we see it is uh, completely dark in optical light. But when you look using uh, uh, infrared light, this contains lots of stars. This looks like uh, uh, dark because there is a lot of dust over here. So infrared can see through dust. This is a very important thing which you should remember throughout this uh, webinar because we will be discussing more about this. This is the picture of a Bernard 68 dust cloud. Okay, so uh, let us come into a, the picture of a galaxy. A galaxy, this is an X-ray image of the galaxy. This is some infrared image, etc. Sorry, UV image. And uh, we can also see the other images. This is a radio image, image. All these images are looking differently because only these portions are emitting radio. And the portions which are emitting uh, ultraviolet will give you this picture. And the uh, portions which are emitting X-ray will give you this picture. So the same galaxy may look different in different wavelengths. And uh, it is like this that we are uh, seeing. A, uh, if you are making a single wavelength observation, it is like uh, the blind man seeing an elephant. So I need not tell you the story about my blind man assessing the shape of an elephant. So we need a multi-wavelength observations in order to understand fully about any astronomical object. This is the point I just wanted to mention to you. Now let us come to, I'm sorry that I have taken much for an introduction, but I, I hope this will be helpful to you. And also this will be a, will be useful when we are discussing all along the James Webb telescope and its capabilities. So this picture, I, all of you might have seen. This is uh, the picture of the James Webb telescope and this is the hexagonal mirror. Uh, the, the 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 joined hexagonal mirrors, uh, which acts as its primary mirror, and uh, we, these are all like this, not like this when it was launched. These are these were all folded up, and uh, in order to have it uh, into a, a, a um, rocket, uh, the the payload portion of the rocket, and uh, this is the fully deployed version. So. Uh, and we will come across all these details. Okay, the James Webb Telescope, about the genesis, the NASA James Webb te uh, Space Telescope is uh, an infrared space observatory that was launched on December 25, 2021 from ESA's launch site at Kourou in French Guyana. And the rocket which was used for uh, launching it is uh, Ariane 5 rocket. The name of the rocket is Ariane 5 rocket. 
Okay, the construction of the JWST actually involved over 300 universities, organizations, and companies across 29 US states and 14 countries. So it is a multi country effort, actually. And by the European Space Agency, the Canadian um, Science, uh, uh, Science uh, uh, Agency, and also the NASA were the participants or the, were the funding agents for this uh, particular uh, telescope project. And uh, the history of uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, James Webb Telescope, I'm not mentioning here because it is available in the web and also you people might have also uh, come across that. And uh, I am not telling that the information which I am providing you is not available in the net. I should also declare here that uh, most of this information I have obtained from the NASA site and the related sites. So maybe even a, few, a, a one or two sentences or a few sentences maybe exactly like because those sentences can be only written like that, uh, exactly like what is there occurring in their websites. And uh, see, this is James Webb Telescope being launched and uh, all the stories, everything you people might have gone come across, so not going into much into that. So I'm just mentioning some a few of the crucial facts. On its journey, the telescope has to complete a difficult mechanical maneuver of assembling itself. So this is the first time that, uh, uh, maybe the first time that this much of assembling was required for a, a, a particular telescope on the way or a particular satellite on the way. So mostly the satellite, when it is deployed, it may spread its uh, solar uh, panel, etc. But the, uh, the, by uh, uh, having so much of mechanical maneuver is uh, only specific to James Webb Telescope. The telescope is so large that it could be launched only by designing it to be folded up inside the rocket. I have mentioned it to you already. It needs almost a month to unfurl its various components from its sun shield to its mirrors during its course to, a, uh, to the orbit around the sun. So this unfurling of various components is happening on the way. So we will we will uh, come across a view graph or, or a video where it is uh, being shown. As per NASA, there are more than 300 potential technical problems or single point failures which could potentially doom the mission. So there can be 300 various ways in which this can fail. Since the JW is not reachable like the Hubble because it is very far away, if in case of any these failures, the telescope may render useless. So that is the risk involved. So for Hubble, as you all will be knowing, Initially, it was not meant like that, but since the Hubble showed some problems, the, there was the service missions which could uh, uh, service Hubble and also to re, uh, it service various service missions were able to replace much of the electronics and uh, instruments so that Hubble was uh, able to give us spun, spun, fantastic pictures of the universe for the last 30 years, even though it was uh, meant only for 10 or 15 years. NASA's largest and most powerful space science telescope costing, uh, 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 this is the NASA's uh, largest and most powerful space science telescope, James Webb telescope. It costs around $10 billion. So 10 times the original uh, amount which was uh, earmarked for it. Because of the great delay of many years, this happened. This, capable of, this uh, telescope is capable of uncovering the history of the universe from the very beginning to the formation of the structures like galaxies and its components like the stars and planets. So we have told everything. So we have told about the formation of the universe, the structure of galaxies, structure of the components like stars and planets. So we can say that this James Webb telescope is able to shed more light in every aspect of the universe, so to say. Okay. Now this is just a two views of uh, the James Webb telescope, uh, the top view and the bottom view. As you all might be knowing, there is this uh, sun shield over here. The need for that and the importance of that will be just discussed. And uh, there are certain modules over here and uh, the telescope is uh, up over here. And always this shield will be shielding this telescope from sun since it is an infrared telescope. Now JWST is uh, usually some of, some people understand it as a replacement of Hubble since the Hubble is uh, there for 30 years and uh, there is a replacement needed. It is not like that. It's actually not a replacement. So, but the, the NASA call it uh, uh, as a successor. It's not a replacement. After all, Webb is the scientific successor to Hubble. Its science goals were motivated by results from Hubble. So whatever results Hubble did bring in, in, in order to augment those results or uh, enhance those results, such a uh, telescope like James Webb Telescope was necessary. The observations of these distant objects, like the first galaxies found in the universe, requires an infrared telescope. Because to look at the early period of the universe, which is very hot, we need an infrared telescope. Infrared is a radiation 
cheap radiation, so to say. So it is better suited to have an infrared telescope to learn the the uh, early phases of uh, the universe. Its capabilities are not identical with the Hubble. It's not identical with Hubble, but it is supplementing or maybe complementing the uh, Hubble's uh, uh, um, capabilities. The, uh, what we mean by web is the telescope. JWST, I might have used web uh, uh, as a short form. Web will primarily look at the universe in the infrared, while Hubble studies its primarily at uh, optical and ultraviolet wavelengths. We know this. So, uh, though, though it has uh, some infrared capability, Hubble is having some infrared capability. Web is also Web also has a much big, bigger mirror than Hubble. We will come across the size of the mirror, etc. very soon. This larger light collecting area means the web can peer further back into time than Hubble. So if the light collecting area is larger, then the uh, web is able to see fainter objects. Fainter objects means they are uh, very far away. So very far away objects can be observed by web. Maybe more far away objects than the Hubble can be observed by web. Hubble is a, in a very close orbit of 560 kilometers around the Earth, while the web will be 1.5 million kilometers away at the second Lagrange point. We'll discuss what the second Lagrange point is. So uh, uh, the uh, James Webb telescope is placed much farther than Hubble. So it has got its advantages because of that. Some disadvantages like the need for a, a shield, etc., are also there. Uh, that, that is not because it is far away, but it is since it is infrared, infrared telescope. Importance of infrared view of the universe. Why? Uh, why? Uh, I, I have mentioned it already, importance of infrared view of the early universe. One reason is that Webb will be able to see the first galaxies. Uh, first galaxies is because it is an infrared telescope. Already mentioned to you, to see the initial stages of uh, our universe, it is better to better suited to have an infrared telescope. The universe and thus the galaxies in it are expanding, as we all know. When we talk about the most distant objects, the expansion of the universe results on the space between the objects to stretch. This is also might be known to the children who are listening to me. There is this expansion of the universe. Expansion means the space between objects are stretching, causing the objects like galaxies to move away from each other. Furthermore, because of this expansion, any light in that space will also stretch, shifting that light's wavelength to longer wavelengths. This is also connected with the Einstein's theories also. So uh, the shifting of light's wavelength when, it, when uh, uh, light's wavelength, uh, shifting of uh, wavelength of the light coming from an object which is moving away from us is called a redshift. This can make distant objects very dim or visible at a visible wavelength of light because that light reaches as uh, infrared light. So the, because of this redshift, this uh, visible wavelengths will be shifted in their wavelength to infrared since it is coming from very far away. Very far away objects are moving away or expanding with the greater speeds. Depending on the speeds, the redshift will be, will be more. That means those visible wavelengths emitted by those objects will be shifted to infrared while it reaches here on a, 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 into our it, it reaches and enters uh, the telescopes on the surface of the Earth or in, the, in space. So we are expecting that the original visible wavelengths from the objects have been redshifted into the infrared light. Therefore, very distant objects are better uh, viewed in visible wavelength by the redshifted infrared light. This visible wavelength will be redshifted to infrared light. Infrared telescopes like Webb are ideal for observing these early galaxies. Okay. So this is just to show how different the visible and the the, the infrared observations are. This is not from James Webb because James Webb has not started sending any images. This is from Hubble. I have mentioned to you that Hubble has got visible uh, capability, visible red, uh, radiation uh, detection capability as well as infrared. A little of infrared is also possible. Comparison of the Carina Nebulae in visible light. This is invisible light and infrared on right. Both images by Hubble in the infrared image. This is taken from NASA. This image is from NASA and this description is also. In the infrared image, we can see more stars that weren't visible before. See here, these stars were not visible here, but these are all stars are visible here. So this is sort of see-through. It can see through this, uh, uh, this uh, dust uh, which is over the, here. I have told you that this dust is capable of uh, observing, uh, absorbing the light coming from the stars which are inside. And therefore, we may not see the stars in visible light, but we can see inside by using the infrared radiations. So she can see through dust uh, by infrared radiation. 
So that's, that is just to uh, depict how infrared is more useful when it comes to observation of a stellar clouds. Okay. The sun shield is a very important component of the JWST. Its proper deployment is very crucial in the functioning of the telescope. Because of the sun shield, the JWST does not have an, an unlimited field of field of uh, view. I, I just, uh, sorry that I missed a field of view. Uh, uh, field of regard, okay, same. Field of regard at any given time. The telescope can see 40% of the sky from one position and can see all of the sky over a period of six months because the telescope, uh, this direction may change, the view, viewing direction may change while it rotates. Uh, around the L2 uh, at the L2 point around the uh, uh, around the sun. Okay, the telescope can see 40% of the sky from one position, one particular position, and can see all of the sky over a period of six months. The amount of time it takes to complete its a uh, halo orbit around L2. So this is the picture of the sun shield, which is a test uh, a test deployed in uh, Northrop Grumman facility. This Northrop Grumman is the agency which built this telescope. This is in 2014. And there was a mishap that initially, when this was tested upon, there was some tear in the in the in this particular sun shield, and that also delayed this project much. The sun shield. Excuse parameter. me, sir. Yes, tell me. Sir, uh, the sun shield is uh, what product is the sun shield made up of? Yeah, just uh, you look at this uh, particular PPT which I am. Can you see the PPT which I am uh, flashing yes, now? Yeah. So we will discuss this. The five layer sun shield, each layer as thin as a human layer, human hair. So in, in, in the five layer sun shield, each layer is as thin as the human hair. This is constructed from Captain E, a commercially available polyamide film from DuPont. DuPont is a, a, a big company in the manufacture of polymers and all. So this particular polymer of which this uh, sun shield is made of is called a Captain E. So what is, what should uh, the capability? It should be possible it should be capable of absorbing the all the radiations which falls on one side of it it shouldn't pass any to the other side so captain e is the material which is a uh, uh, which is a uh, used for uh, constructing this uh, sun shield uh, with membranes specially coated with aluminium on both sides and a layer of doped silicon on the sun facing side of the two hottest layers to reflect the sun's heat back into space so in the sun facing side uh, the layer of doped silicon is uh, coated and the other side it is aluminium. So the intention is to provide none of the radiations from the sun to get into the telescope. Then it will spoil, uh, if that happens, it will spoil the whole image which is uh, available. So accidental tears of the delicate film structure during testing in 2018 were among the factors delaying the project. So this is one of the factors which delayed the project in 2018. Accidentally, th there was a tear when this film structure was being experimented with. The sun shield was designed to be folded 12 times so that it fit within the Ariane 5 rockets payload firing, which is 4.57 meter in diameter and 16.19 meter long. This should go into this. Therefore, it was hard to be folded to 12 times. Um, 12 times. So this is, the, this is the dimension of this particular material, this shield. The shield is fully deployed. The dimensions are planned as a 14.162 meter into 21.197 meter. So sorry, this is the actual dimension and this is the dimension into which it is folded. Okay. The sun shield was hand assembled at Mantec in Huntsville, Alabama before. This is not, uh, not, not of that importance, but I just uh, copied it from Wikipedia. So this information is also here about the sun shield. Okay. So about the mirror. So the web will have an approximately 6.5 meter diameter primary mirror. So you know that in a telescope, there can be a primary mirror and a secondary mirror and a tertiary mirror possibly. So this is the primary mirror. There is a secondary mirror which is placed over here and all the infrared radiations which are uh, ejected, from, uh, which are reflected from here will reach here and it will be again radiated to the tertiary mirror over here. And then it can go into various instruments which are on the backside of this uh, particular uh, telescope uh, assembly. So there is a comparison between the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Telescope. Uh, you can see that the uh, yeah, Hubble Space Telescope is much smaller. And I have already mentioned to you that the mirror which is placed somewhere inside here, is because it's a Cassegrain telescope, the mirror will be existing somewhere here. This is a sort of a pipe and uh, light will be entering like this. This is a shield which can close this. And uh, the light will reach a mirror over here, which is 2.4 meters in diameter. And this infrared 
uh, the telescope is having a mirror, which is 6.5 meter in uh, diameter. And therefore, the collecting area is much more. Collecting area is much more. JW has a collecting area around 6.25 times that of the Hubble. So the capability of a telescope to see far away and also to see faint objects all depends upon uh, one of the parameters of the telescope, which is the collecting area. There is also other parameters which we are not mentioning. So a better collecting area means uh, it can see fainter objects and farther objects. So that's uh, the, cap the better capability of uh, this James Webb telescope. So these numbers, you should remember, this has a diameter of uh, 6.5 meter and uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, uh, mirror has a diameter of uh, 2.4 meters. So, and the uh, collecting area of uh, Hubble is this much, 4.5 meters square, okay. So then uh, we will discuss because the mirror is the one of the important uh, components of uh, this uh, uh, James Webb telescope. So we should dwell a little more into the features of the JWST. JWST's primary mirror is 6.5 meter and gold coated brilliant reflector with a collecting area of 25.4 meter square. Mirror is composed of 18 hexagonal segments, as you could see, which will unfold after the telescope is launched. Uh, this is some uh, de detail which uh, may not be, I may not discuss. The web telescope will use 126 small motors to occasionally adjust the optics as there are a few environmental disturbances of a telescope in space. So this uh, section of uh, mirrors may be a little very minimally uh, displaced and all. So in order to correct that, there are actuators uh, with the motors, almost 126 motors are there in order to adjust the position of these uh, hexagonal mirrors as you could see from the image. So as to have a very... Uh, smooth shape for the surface of the uh, telescope. So this optical uh, design is a three mirror uh, uh, anastic mat design. I have already told you about the three mirrors, the primary, the secondary and the tertiary. The secondary mirror is 0.74 in, uh, in diameter. Okay, the other details are, uh, see, just to show you the difference, this is uh, the size of the Hubble's primary mirror and this is a person standing here and the JWST uh, primary mirror will be something, somewhat like this. And uh, we have already mentioned that there are 18 hexagonal segments. Look at this. These are 18 of hexagonal segments. This can clearly join together in order to have a spherical or a, or a, or a curved shape like this. So the curved shape is not visible in this picture, but uh, it is visible in this particular picture. And this is gold coated for a better reflection of uh, the infrared. Okay. I just, uh, I, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I have included a, uh, a video which shows you how this uh, mirror, secondary mirror is uh, being uh, uh, unfurled and uh, or uh, it is uh, it's, it's in the folded position earlier and then it will be deployed in the actual way in which the secondary mirror should be placed like this which, uh, sorry, maybe I can show you once more, you just observe this. Secondary mirror is on a kind of a report kind of an uh, assembly, and uh, this is how it is being deployed. It's just a video of that. Okay. Now about the observatory. Observatory means uh, the the whole sum of uh, the, the observ uh, where the observations are made. The JWC observatory includes the three main elements: the integrated science instrument module, where all the science instruments will be there; the optical telescope module; the spacecraft element, which comprises the spacecraft bus and the sun shield. So its wavelength will be from points, uh, the wavelength which is sensitive for to this telescope will be from 0.6 micrometer to 28.5 micrometer. This is uh, visible to mid-infrared. And for compared to HST, it, it is from 0.1 micrometer to 2.5 micrometer, ultraviolet to the near-infrared. The infrared uh, part of the HST's uh, observation capability is this much, but for the JWST, this much is the wider um, in, uh, capability is there. Okay. Now, these are the various uh, instruments. I'm not discussing about the instruments. Most of the instruments, as you can see, are in infrared. IR means infrared. IR, 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 you can see. All these are uh, various instruments which are uh, able to uh, decipher the infrared radiation which is received by the antenna. So, this is a near-infrared camera. Its wavelength is also given. It's a wide-field kind of uh, spectrograph where the spectrum, infrared spectrum, can be uh, deciphered. This is MIRI, is a combined mid-infrared camera and a spectrograph. This uh, instrument is a combined observatory fine guidance system and a near-infrared imager, which can bring in images, infrared images, and also it can do slitless spectrograph. So I'm not going into the details because this will involve much uh, of a deeper science, and uh, no, so I'm not going into this. Just understand that these are the various instruments which are there. Four instruments are there on the 
uh, science side of uh, the uh, the the, the uh, James Webb telescope. See about the orbit of the James Webb telescope. James Webb telescope traveled for a month to reach its final operating location. This is approximately 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. You can see here, the sun is here. Mercury, Venus, Earth is here. From Earth, this is a uh, sun is 150 uh, million kilometers, and uh, the 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 uh, the, uh, the James Webb Telescope is 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth, like this. Moon's distance is also given. Hubble is actually orbiting like this, but the Webb is far away in the L2 orbit. Webb will orbit the Sun uh, uh, at 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. Which is at that point is called the L2. We will discuss about it very soon. Okay, the 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 whole uh, uh, the James Webb Telescope will be somewhat of a tennis court size, and uh, this allows the this particular uh, uh, sun shield will allow at an extremely low temperature of minus 233 degrees centigrade um, uh, for the telescope and the instruments, which is uh, very crucial in operating it in uh, infrared. Because uh, the temperature, if the temperature is uh, higher, then uh, the instruments itself may produce some infrared radiations, which will uh, meddle with uh, the actual infrared radiations coming from the uh, uh, astronomical objects. So it shouldn't happen. Therefore, one side should be, the telescope side to be kept very cool, even though the other side, uh, the sun rays can come and image on the other side. I have mentioned about the sun shield and how it shields this telescope. So the shielding is very important. And uh, this is how the Lagrange points are there. The Lagrange points are points uh, uh, in a three-body system. If there are three bodies orbiting or, uh, in the in space, then there are uh, specific points which has got its own uh, its own uh, properties, which I am not able to discuss to you now. But these are the points L1, L4, L5, L3. This is the Sun. This is the Earth, and uh, this is uh, this is the Moon. And this is the James Webb Telescope. So here is the L2 point. So uh, as the Earth orbits the Sun, Webb will orbit with it, but stay fixed in the same spot with relation to the Earth and the Sun. Satellites orbit around the L2 point, as you can see in the diagram. Usually the satellites orbit around its L2 point, as you can see from the diagram. They don't stay completely motionless as a, at a fixed spot. Just to make the things more clear, I have just included one video which you can visualize now. So how these, uh, this is... a uh, the James Webb Telescope orbiting on L2, and uh, this is Earth orbiting down the Sun. So this has got a little complicated kind of a motion around the Sun. So this video is available. You, you can see it later on. So it will just uh, move, but uh, the L2 point is at the center. Okay. Now the current status of the WST where the JWST is and such information is available from this. Uh, I, I just uh, included this as a link because every every second or uh, every moment it is changes. You can see here how much time has uh, elapsed after the launch, then uh, how far is it from Earth uh, to L2 orbit, how much distance is there, distance completed, and uh, the cruising speed, etc. All these information are available. Most of you might have uh, seen this. Now, these are the temperatures on the two sides of the telescope. Now, the condition is, see, you can see these are all. Here, the sun shield unfurling started over here uh, from third day onwards. And uh, here on the 11th day or so, the secondary mirror was, uh, I showed you the uh, the video of that, was deployed. Then here, this uh, primary mirror will be start uh, getting, starting unfold, unfolding these days mirror segments, etc. So all these activities will be taking in a manner of some one month or so. Now, the test temperature at uh, this side and uh, the, the bottom side and the top side are given here. Top side will be cooler and this will be the temperature and the bottom side will be hotter because it will be uh, it will be um, uh, facing the sun. So there the temperature is much. So lot of temper much temperature difference between both the sides because of this sun shield, which is essential for the functioning of this uh, James Webb telescope. So we can see how far the telescope has uh, enhanced by looking at this particular uh, uh, view graph from the diagram. And uh, uh, till now, the, web, uh, the James Webb telescope is uh, functioning uh, in a, uh, exactly in the way it was meant for. Okay, so that is a, a matter of happiness for all those who are involved in the project and all the astronomers. Okay. Okay, this has got other information also, which we'll be just uh, skipping and uh, we'll be coming to this. And uh, okay, 
now we will discuss there after i don't know how much time it is left uh, it's much time uh, has elapsed unfortunately so okay maybe 15 more minutes or a little more maybe 20 minutes okay. okay thank you thank you thank you so thereafter i'll be discussing thereafter what will happen so i told you thereafter means after the james webb telescope the whole view of a regarding the universe will change because of a newer and newer information coming in. So, what all are these uh, new information which are expected? So, we are expecting all this because I have always when we build a telescope, a, a, whether it is a space telescope or a ground-based telescope, we have got uh, science cases for it. So, students should uh, or children should look into whenever you see about a, see uh, the picture or the website of a telescope, you should go into the science cases. Those are much important uh, aspects for a uh, scientists. So the James Webb Space Telescope will be a giant leap forward in our quest for understanding the universe and our origins. It will examine every phase of cosmic history from the first luminous close after the Big Bang to the formation of galaxies, stars and planets to the evolution of our own solar system. So everything in the universe can be proved using this uh, JWST. The James Webb Space Telescope has four key goals. These uh, points I have taken from the NASA side. One goal is to search for light from the first stars and galaxies that formed in the universe after the Big Bang. So we, we will see the details of uh, the first ever stars and galaxies which were formed in the universe. And second one is to study the formation and evolution of galaxies. So these galaxies were originally formed as a uh, proto galaxies or so small galaxies. Then they merged together and they, they evolved together with the expansion of the universe. And we see the galaxies as big galaxies. Uh, nowadays since it has evolved over time. So to study the formation and evolution of galaxies is another goal then to understand the formation of stars and planetary systems better. So when stars are formed there is a lot of heat radiations which are involved. Protoplanetary disks are there surrounding the stars when they are formed. So the James Webb telescope can explore the properties of these protoplanetary uh, systems etc because lots of infrared radiation will be emitted during the formation stage of a star. So that's why James Webb Telescope can shed more light into the formation of uh, stars and uh, planetary systems. So, so the planetary systems are uh, origin originated from are originating from the protoplanetary disks which are sur uh, which are uh, surrounding the star, the original star. So these protoplanetary systems, uh, sorry, protoplanetary disks can be better studied using this uh, telescope. This uh, also to study the planetary systems and the origin of life, exoplanets. We can learn about exoplanets and we can very well, we, we have information that uh, some of the exoplanets are uh, conducive for life or uh, it is uh, already observed that the conditions as far as we know are suitable for life. But whether there can exist life or not is uh, detected or uh, it is, uh, it, it's, uh, it, uh, it, is uh, uh, it should be understood by uh, understanding the atmospheric conditions. So the atmospheric conditions uh, on a planet can be understood in more detail using the James Webb Space Telescope. So if you understand about the presence of organic gases like methane, uh, etc., then we can say whether there is uh, life in the planet or not. So to precisely, currently there are some information available using the Hubble, but the more and more decisive information will be available about the planetary systems and about the possibility of life but through the observations made by JWST. So it is going to bring in revolution into the field of astrophysics. Okay, so the science cases we have discussed a little more in detail, it is uh, being discussed here and uh, further details are coming up. The end of the dark ages, the first light and reionization. First light and reionization happened when the first stars and uh, galaxies formed. So we can peer back over 13.5 billion years to see the first stars and the galaxies forming out of the darkness of the early universe, which was not possible till now. So the, the age of the universe is only 13.8 billion years. So maybe from 250 or 300 million years after the beginning of the universe, we can see the conditions over there. Hubble was not able to do that un until that much. But Hubble was able to see nearer, but uh, maybe some 500 mil uh, million or so after the Big Bang, Hubble, were able, uh, Hubble, was, Hubble Deep Field was able to decipher. But further into the beginning stages of the universe, the James Webb Telescope can shed more light into. Then about the assembly of galaxies, 
we can compare the faintest earliest galaxies to today's grand spirals and ellipticals by the wst observations and then we can understand how the earlier galaxies might have transformed into this kind of bigger galaxies and also we can study we can see right through and into massive clouds of dust and are uh, the, that are opaque to visible light observatories like hubble so more detailed information of a uh, protoplanetary disks and the birth of stars are available using jwst then this jwst will tell us more about the atmosphere of exosolar so exosolar planets other planets which are outside our solar system those uh, information are also will be uh, will also be available through jwst now this is just a view graph which is, uh, shows uh, an important aspect of astrophysics because of the time it takes light to travel the farther away an object is the farther back in time we are looking so this is a very crucial information which everybody who learn astrophysics in the preliminary stages to, should understand so the, if we can the farther away an object is the farther back in time we are looking if we can observe a farther away object farther away object means the light has taken more time to reach us that means we are seeing light which has started from an earlier epoch in the evolution of the universe so to see farther away means see the conditions of the younger universe so that is much much important in understanding the evolution of the universe that idea is being uh, be, being uh, uh, given here so seeing back into the cosmos this is just a diagram see hst uh, uh, hubble space Tele telescope goods and goods is a, a survey and the chandra d field could see only up to this 1 billion years after the big bang this is sort of big bang then jwst is able to see up to this means the first stars formed, the first galaxies formed, etc. That is a, almost like a 0.3 billion years after the Big Bang. This can be seen. So there is some period of time where there were no information because of a, no emissions were there, no radiations were capable of being uh, deciphered. Uh, so this is called a dark age. So we can see up to this. So this dark age, there is no information because there are no, no uh, much uh, radiation coming out. So it may not be possible to get idea about uh, this dark age, but uh, near, very near to dark age, we are able to see using this uh, JWST. Okay. Now about the early universe. After the Big Bang, the universe was like a hot soup of particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, etc. When the universe started cooling, the protons and neutrons began combining into ionized atoms of hydrogen and eventually some helium. So hydrogen and helium were the primordial elements which were present. So hopefully you will be understanding that the universe as such produced only hydrogen and helium in its beginning. All other elements which you study in chemistry, in periodic table, all of them are created inside stars. So the stellar stars are very important. See, you all understand that we are made of a mostly carbon. So this carbon is actually taken from some stars or is synthesized by some stars. So we can very well in a um, uh, in, a, in a way, we can say that we are all stardust. So the most of the carbon and the other elements which uh, are a part of our uh, uh, our uh, body, they come from various stars. It may not be from sun. It may be from some stars which were there before sun in the uh, in the uh, in the place where sun formed. Those stars might have uh, might have exploded, and all the inside material like uh, the iron. Uh, sulfur, oxygen, and uh, carbon, everything might have been spewed out into the uh, space. And later on, from that space, the sun formed, and uh, from the sun, the earth formed, and uh, we uh, generated, we were generated in uh, earth, and therefore the carbon which we have our uh, in our inside might be from even from various stars. We don't know. So we actually don't know our genesis. We don't know from which star we have been created, but we know for sure that possibly this carbon should have come from some stars which have exploded earlier. So this, uh, this is because of the fact that uh, the hydrogen and the helium were the only elements which were produced in the, uh, just after the Big Bang. Okay. Synthesized, so to say, or uh, formed out of these particles. These ionized atoms of hydrogen and helium attracted electrons, turning them into neutral atoms, which allowed light to travel freely for the first time, since this light was no longer scattered of free, free electrons. The universe became transparent. So universe became transparent only after some time after the uh, after the big bang and uh, that period is also well known to scientists that is 380000 
uh, years after the Big Bang, the universe became transparent. It means the radiations were completely uh, detached from the uh, matter so that it can, uh, uh, it can propagate freely. So before that, radiation and matter were intermingled so that no specific information is available. But from 380,000 years, this radiation were, were detached, so to say, detached from the matter so that the radiation are having information about that period. Which period? From 380,000 years onwards, we can get information about the condition of the universe by deciphering the radiations. Before that, we can't because there is a lot of interaction between light and matter. We, we are not able to. It is just smeared out. All the history is smeared out. So, the universe at this point was three times more hydrogen and, and helium than helium. So, universe originally formed with 75% hydrogen approximately, 75% hydrogen and 25% helium plus some light elements. However, these are all, I'm not just telling this, there are also theories and also Nobel Prizes were given a few years back for this uh, particular idea of uh, theoretically and uh, as well as practically proving that uh, the universe earlier, uh, uh, initial composition was uh, uh, hydrogen three, uh, three parts and uh, helium one part. However, it would still be some time, perhaps up to the few hundred million years post Big Bang, before the first source of light would start to form, ending the cosmic dark ages. We mentioned about dark ages, Big Bang, and then there is dark ages. After dark ages, there was light. Light started to form by reionization, means uh, by the formation of stars. So here the matter was existing as a, in atomic stage, not ionized, because there are there were no radiations. But then suddenly, over after the dark ages, the stars started to form. What is happening inside stars? Inside stars, the hydrogen is getting converted into helium. What will be the aftermath of aftermath of that? There will be radiations coming out. So these radiations are capable of uh, ionizing the atoms which are present over here. And therefore, the universe was re-ionized. Uh, just after the Big Bang, it was in the ionized form. All these particles were there. Atoms were not formed, but the nucleus were also formed uh, and the atoms were formed later on. So it was in the ionized form. So there is re-ionization because of the light which is coming out of the first ever formed stars. So this is called the era of reionization. So exactly what the universe first light looked like and exactly when the first stars formed is not known. Currently it is not known, but with the JWST it will be, it will be known. So this is the first science goal of the JWST. Okay. So just a, a few sentences about the cosmic microwave background radiation. So cosmic microwave background radiation is map is given here. And here we see some red spots as well as blue spots. So these red and blue spots uh, uh, regions are regions of the universe much early, just after the 3,80,000 years after the Big Bang. What was the speciality of that particular period? During that period, the radiation got detached from the matter and it started traveling its, uh, alone without much interaction with matter. So information after that is available. So at that period of time, how the universe was? So the universe was not uniform in its temperature even though the universe is at a very high temperature at that time, there was a very minute change in the temperature of the universe in various portions. And this minute change is of the order of 10 raised to minus 5 Kelvin. Imagine, very small, 0. 0.00001 degree Kelvin. But that much difference in temperature during that period of the universe is uh, decipherable by space satellites like this. And uh, this map could be produced. So what is the importance of this uh, cosmic microwave background radiation map? This map will tell us that since this portion and this portion is having a temperature difference of 10 raised to minus 5 Kelvin, the densities here as well as here are different. If the density is different, then those portions which are having better densities will be later on due to gravity form into galaxies and all. So this difference in the temperature, minute difference in the temperature in the cosmic microwave background radiation gives us a complete idea about how or oh, all these structures of galaxies, etc., were formed in the universe. The reason for that is clearly depicted in this particular cosmic microwave background radiation map. And this is the map of the universe at the 3 lakh 80,000 years. And this is the earliest picture of the universe. Beyond that, we won't be able to get any, any picture. So, out of the 13.8 billion years age of the universe, from the beginning, after 3 lakh 80,000 years, universe was somewhat like this. 
So this shape, etc., has got certain other reasons. Originally, it was spherical, so to say. This heat covers this heat covers the entire sky and fills the universe. In fact, it still does. Still, the remnants of this radiation are available, and uh, that is available in the, at a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin, which is called a uh, cosmic microwave background radiation currently. So this we can map. This is minute changes in this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, current temperature can be mapped and. Uh, the, uh, and uh, the, the, this uh, the change in the temperature will be giving us an idea about uh, the structure formation. So the telescopes, uh, satellites uh, were uh, deployed in order to uh, the, the, have this map, all sky picture of the infant universe created from nine years of uh, W map data. So the telescopes like W map Kobe. So the full form of Kobe is a cosmic background explorer. Why is it called so? Because cosmic microwave background radiation is being mapped by cosmic background explorer. So this is abbreviated as a COBE, cosmic background explorer. So cosmic background explorer as well as WMAP are the and the Planck are the satellites which were uh, which were mapping this cosmic microwave background radiation. The universe at this point was extremely smooth with only tiny ripples in temperature. I mentioned about it to you. The era of recombination is the earliest form in cosmic history which we can look back with any form of light. So this era of recombination is the earliest form of cosmic history which we can look back with any form of light. Now, the epoch of reionization, I mentioned to you, the reionization happened because of uh, this first, the first ever spurting of uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, stars. So the first stars formed were 30 to 300 times as massive as our sun, millions of times brighter. Lifetime was very short and exploded into supernova in a few million years. These are, all these aspects has got its own reasons. I'm not mentioning any of these reasons. This is not just statements, but these statements are uh, supported by scientific facts. So earlier stars were very big, 30 to 300 times the mass of the sun. The resulting energetic ultraviolet radiation did reionize the universe. The era from the end of the dark ages to when the universe was billion years old is known as a epoch of reionization. So the era from the end of dark ages until the universe billion years old is called the epoch of reionization. But the reionization is an important phenomenon in the universe history which provides us the means of studying the earlier stars. So this is just a big figure of uh, the uh, epoch of reionization and the further period of uh, expansion of the universe. I'm not mentioning much about this. Now, the earliest uh, images which we currently have are from the Hubble and uh, which is called the Hubble Deep Field. Hubble Deep Field uh, images were taken by uh, by facing by by pointing the Hubble Space Telescope to a particular portion of the sky for uh, uh, many days and continuously collecting light from that so that it can go into finer galaxies. So the first significant look back in the era of the universe when early galaxies were forming, this is uh, the Hubble Deep Field. You can see very small, small, these patches are all tiny galaxies in the in formation. And also the foreground galaxies are also there. Looking at the uh, redshift, we can understand uh, that these uh, small patches are uh, earlier galaxies, which are called might be proto galaxies. The image is a long exposure of a very small area of the sky, which revealed a large number of very faint and previously unseen objects. These objects are some of the oldest and most distant galaxies and allow, allowed us a glimpse of the first steps of galaxy formation. Webb's imaging capabilities and infrared vision will show us the early universe with the unprecedented clarity. With more clarity than this, we are going to get further very spectacular images of the early portions of the universe. So what will JWST see? JWST was designed not to see the beginning of the universe, but to see a period of the universe history that we have not yet seen before. That time period is perhaps hundreds of millions of years later than the one Kobe WMAP and the Planck were built to see. So this Kobe, etc., they could uh, picture the universe at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is very close to Big Bang. But the WMAP or any of the telescopes may not be able to see this other than this, uh, this uh, uh, mic uh, microwave uh, uh, telescopes like Kobe, WMAP and Planck, etc. Uh, none of the currently available uh, infrared or uh, optical telescopes will be able to see this much. We think that the tiny ripples in temperature they observed were the seeds that eventually grew into galaxies. This I have just mentioned to you. We don't know exactly when the universe made the first stars and galaxies or how for that matter. JWST will help us to answer this. Answer what? Answer at what time the first stars and galaxies were formed. Now the JWST is designed to see the infrared, the redshift, redshift advantage. This idea I have already mentioned to you. From light from the faraway objects which are coming to us will be shifted towards red. 
and therefore visible radiation emitted by an object will reach us in the form of a infrared so infrared telescopes will be much suited for a observing objects at a very high redshift very high redshift means objects which are very far away so jwst is a powerful near and mid infrared telescope which is capable of seeing the first stars and galaxies okay now what is the importance the importance also i have already mentioned to you the chemical elements of life were first produced in the first generation of stars after the big bang we are here today because of them one way or another the first stars must have influence our own history beginning with stirring up everything and producing the other chemical elements besides hydrogen and helium so i have already mentioned to you about this idea that the chemical components of our body even may come from the some of the earlier stars we don't know so understanding the formation and uh, the composition of the earlier stars is much important so how jwst will study the early universe it has got this ultra deep near infrared survey uh, or it will conduct an ultra deep near infrared survey of the universe and it can, it has got a low resolution spectrograph and a mid infrared photometric device is also there so using all this it can uh, map the conditions at that particular period now what all are the key questions which will be addressed when and how the, did reionization occur what sources caused to reionization what are the first galaxies these are the questions which are going to be answered by jwst now coming to the next uh, next goal galaxies over time so i have already mentioned to you that the galaxies which were formed as proto galaxies uh, merged together in order to form larger and larger galaxies and finally we have come across galaxies which we see in the current universe so these are some of the pictures of the proto galaxies from the picture which i have shown you uh, as the, this this picture these small small galaxies are particularly mapped over here so these are the proto galaxies so the proto galaxies evolved on to form the currently existing galaxies and these evolutions usually took place through galactic galactic mergers like this smaller galaxies uh, came together and merged like this and bigger galaxies were formed giant elliptical galaxies are thought to be also formed by the process of similar sized galaxies colliding disrupting each other and merging so these kinds of merger and uh, formation of larger galaxies and evolution of galaxies everything can be studied by uh, the jwst in fact it is thought that nearly all massive galaxies have undergone at least one major merger since the universe was 6 billion years old this is a this galaxy pair is called the mice which is a pair of colliding galaxy this is not from jst jwst this is from hubble but more of information on galaxy evolution will be available through jwst and what all are the key questions addressed according uh, as per the second uh, science call how are galaxies formed what gives them their shapes how are the chemical elements distributed through the galaxies how do the central black holes in galaxies influence their host galaxies what happens when small and large galaxies collide to or join together these questions will be answered by hubble sorry uh, jwst now this you might have seen this is called the pillars of a creation these are all stellar nurseries wherein lots of stars are forming all this uh, uh, this uh, structure like thing is actually dust from where dust and gas from where lots of galaxies are forming so these are called nebulae and this nebulae is called eagle nebulae from eagle nebulae lots of stars are forming i have already shown you a picture wherein using an optical telescope we will get only images like this but if you are using an infrared telescope then you can peer through this uh, dust and uh, see the stars which are being uh, formed within this uh, stellar nurseries so web which is optimized for near infrared and 100 times more powerful than hubble will be able to give you fantastic details about this uh, creation of stars now the study of star formation i have already mentioned to you a star will be usually formed as a spherical uh, entity with this disk kind of structure and this disk kind of structure will uh, will evolve into our planets so the study of these disks are very important so jwst is uh, much capable of studying this protoplanetary disk because it uh, emits heat radiation or infrared much therefore jwst is much suited for studying the star formation and planet formation etc and due to lack of time i am not going into the very much very very details but i have given you the summary of what i have meant I, i wanted to convey to you so study of star formation now what all are the key questions in this particular science call how do clouds of gas and dust collapse to form stars why do most stars form in groups exactly how do planetary systems form how do stars evolve and release the heavy elements they produce back into space for recycling into new generation of stars and planets these are the questions now we come to the last uh, goal which is uh, 
given by NASA. This is uh, the world of exoplanets. Just uh, I'm going into another NASA website. Just look at this. We will see the number of uh, exoplanets which are currently detected by the NASA by various satellites. See the number of exoplanets detected till now is uh, 4,884. So I'm just acquainting you with this uh, website, which is called the NASA exoplanetary website. It will give you how many exoplanets are currently being dis uh, uh, discovered. Maybe tomorrow this number may vary because this is an ongoing process and how many candidates are there, how many planetary systems are uh, uh, detected, etc. will be given by, uh, by this uh, website. Okay. Having said that, let us go into the JWST for studying exoplanets. Scientists have found thousands of exoplanets and uh, also a few star systems. One method we will use for studying exoplanets is the transit method, studying the dimming of the light from a star as its planet passes between us and the star. This is one of the methods by which the exoplanets can be detected. So James Webb Telescope will be able to detect more and discover more and more exoplanets, even though uh, telescopes, uh, satellites uh, like Kepler uh, was able and TESS were able to spot many, uh, uh, many uh, exoplanets. More such exoplanets will be spotted by JWST and also it is capable of uh, studying about the atmosphere of these exoplanets to much greater detail so that we may be in a position to tell whether there is greater possibility, there is uh, possibility of uh, life or we can say that surely there should be life in the, in the planet. We cannot say whether it is human beings or vegetation or whatever because we can't see that much, but we can say surely that there are there is life on a such an exoplanet by peering on the planet using JWST. JWST can decipher the atmospheric conditions or atmospheric components and tell us about that. Okay, so this is uh, one of the, uh, the details which are uh, of the exoplanets which are uh, which are expected out of the observations of JWST. So the studies of the property of planets can be done. Webb will also carry coronograph to enable direct imaging of exoplanets near bright stars. So we can just mask the bright star and map the exoplanet itself using this coronograph. The image of the exoplanet would just be a spot, but by studying it, we can learn a great deal about it. Study of its color, difference between winter and summer, vegetation, rotation, weather can be done using spectroscopy. So spectroscopy will be the tool which will be used for studying the atmospheric conditions of the planet, which will give us some information regarding the life, which is whether life exists there or not. Okay, so these are the key questions. So the key questions in this last science call is so much. So I'm not going to read all of that. So how are the building blocks of planets assembled? What are the constitutions of the circular disks and give that give rise to planetary systems? Do planets in a planetary system form in place or travel invade after forming in the outer reaches of the system? So many. So these are all there in the NASA website. So please go and explore. So this is a great opportunity for you to learn about JWST and what JWST will provide. So what is JWST and thereafter? We can say that a revolution in the knowledge regarding the universe is uh, awaiting after JWST. So be a part of this revolution because I am sure that you children who are listening to me will be, uh, some of you at least will be going into astrophysics and will be able to, uh, able to get data from JWST and work on that. Okay, best wishes. Thank you.
Hi, uh, am I audible? Okay, first of all, great new year to everyone. And <laughs> what a way to start a new year by listening, you know, listening to lecture from Joe Jacob, sir. And yeah, I, I know him personally for like almost a decade now. And we keep in touch very often. And yeah, and I, it seems very apt that he's giving this lecture at this point of time where we have this milestone observatory getting launched. And so, yeah, it's, I am sure that students learned a lot by listening to his lecture. To me, it was also very, yeah, educational. It was like a refresher course in astrophysics for me. I was able to connect him with UL Space Club. Uh, so I would say this is just the beginning. Like we should, he's a great teacher. So we should, we should like, we should learn more from him and probably he can give us more lectures. And uh, I would be also looking forward to a lecture about uh, the super, the Saraswati supercluster where is he discovered. So that would be, a nice uh, opportunity to learn more more about it. And yeah, and special thanks to Shajil sir and Kuti sir, Varun and uh, the whole UL Space Club team for you know organizing this event. And we can actually, uh, it's a nice opportunity where people from different expertise, uh, ISRO scientists and astrophysicists like Joe Jacob, like they can meet and share thoughts and then students can you know, benefit a lot from all this and you can also see how complicated this sort of equipment is it's like an engineering marvel there are like a lot of risks involved as he said like you know it's you launch and forget and if it's going to l2 so if there is some issue it's very hard to repair so that kind of emphasis like puts a lot of emphasis on modeling and simulation and high precision engineering and uh, those sort of things, but the science goals and that we can actually achieve once it's successful is very, very rewarding. So it's worth taking this challenge. Yeah. So that's the that's that that's the things that I was going to mention. And yeah. So very happy to be part of this lecture series. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nikhil Bukut. Uh, I will get a few words from the Dr. S. Rangarajan, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll definitely make it just a few words because it's been such an excellent talk by Dr. Shagab. It was beautiful. The topic itself was so important because everybody, even the uh, uh, person in the street, knows you know, what is AWST because it's in the headlines. And choosing that, but developing it in such a way that it will reach out to the audience because UN Space Club has been primarily looking at the younger folks and then making them more and more enthusiastic about these topics. And from that point of view, I think it has really done its job for having gotten him at the beginning of the year. I know the new year begins so well for our club and we do hope there'll be several uh, lectures of this class and I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for the opportunity of George Ek, sir. Uh, Dr. S. Regrajan is from ISRO, former director and master control facility center. Uh, sir. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Then also, I invite Anger Sol, sir, uh, from, he's also from a scientist from ISRO. He's joining with some Chandra Chidambaram and he raised a hand. I could see him. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> sir, uh, uh, a great talk. Uh, I am as far as uh, a space technologist, but uh, a child in the astrophysics area. And it was uh, so nice to hear uh, about the development uh, and the especially exciting development. And uh, I would, in my own words, I can call it is a history book. Uh, James Webb's telescope will be a history book, yet its chapters are to be written. <laughs> that, that is that's a very unique thing, which looking back into history, and yet chapters are uh, written, uh, yet to be written. Uh, that's the thing which excites all of us, and also uh, the children uh, who are listening to this um, great talks are uh, 
thanks to you for your time and we would like to hear from you more as uh, things unravel uh, and you would write more chapters and give us more information thank you sir thank you so much then we have thank you very much. we have one as amateur astronomer dr surendra kuneseri with us and he is joined with us uh, with his uh, mother tongue welcome surendra sir surendra sir surendra sir surendra kuneseri okay then i invite uh, shivaraman sir he is uh, continuously supporting our students and uh, he is joining from ahmedabad shivaraman sir welcome. good afternoon to all it was a very good talk by dr jones uh, in fact i had been following about the jwst uh, since beginning and uh, the details provided today were summarized beautifully uh, such a big so many details were brought out and uh, it is a good collection of all the points of jwst and uh, i think the students would have understood the importance of how, how the universe was born and how the elements were formed all this were brought out in the talk today and uh, i think the young students from all over the place should uh, follow further stories we will be hearing about the jwst and uh, understand the discovery is made and uh, uh, have a great future of our understanding the real truth thank you very much thank you sir thank you uh, thank you sir and we have uh, pj but sir is there with us and he is continuously supporting from the inception of this space club from 2016 welcome sir <laughs> okay what sir thank you uh, shaji sir <clears throat> dr jacob sir uh, first of all i think i would like to personally thank you so much because it was an excellent talk it was an excellent talk as i just second uh, dr shivaram shivaram's opinion that uh, even though we have been getting information because we have very keen to follow up this <laughs> jwst we have been getting information in pieces but here you put it together and you took us right from you know the way you started off and uh, introduced to you know the the, the requirements of this uh, space observation uh, for astronomical purpose and astronomy and then took us through various missions and then uh, got into jwst talked about not only you touched on its configuration aspect challenging aspects of configuration its orbital mission aspects and then you covered so much in detail sir about about the science aspect which which part which i was of course i am i am not a person from that area so it helped me a lot to understand the key goals of science i am sure i am sure this is going to do wonders this is going to do wonders and i really we thank all of you astronomers sir all of you astronomers for utilizing the data from all these missions i know some of the missions have had a lot of problems but still the way you people utilize the data and generate the results and give you know the contribution to the uh, society in terms of the knowledge of the universe i think hats off to you sir you covered it so well thank you very much and special thanks to your space club for organizing such fantastic webinars thank you thank you but sir we all are there with your space club and we the people <laughs> who make this your space club okay thank you for your support and words and we uh, before we are going to thank approaching you. our students two more people are with us patnaban sir and uh, sundar muthi sir and uh, our students will arrange their questions before that uh, please come uh, patnaban sir please <laughs> Patmanavan sir, it was an excellent lecture. As we have heard and said, Rangarajan sir, sir, he has covered from the mission aspect to the final utilization aspect of the satellite. It is very complex. Everybody knows. He has brought out that how complex is the satellite? How complex is its operation in the space in assembling? A you know telescope in the space, assembling a telescope in the space as assembling of one on the ground. He has brought out the most complex the operation because we have done similar uh, operations or deployed.
Vajinas and uh, booms, etc. But this is much, much more complex. And Professor Jacob has brought out the complexity very well. More than that, in the new year, Professor Jacob has come out with an answer to many, many questions our young scientists are asking about the universe. Black holes. Uh, how the uh, fundamental elements were generated. Here is the answer to them. Most of them will get their answer to using the James Wave telescope in conjunction with the earlier observation. Jacob, sir, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And you have introduced a sub complex subject in a very nice way to the students, seeking answers to many, many questions. How you have brought it down. Thank you very much and happy new year to all of you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Sundarmurthy, sir, Palpanavan, sir, and Sundarmurthy, sir, from ISRO, sir, for the information of Joe Jacob, sir. Yeah, uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I don't want to be stand in between the students and Jacob sir, but uh, he has uh, really uh, taken this uh, JWC in a so simple way. And in the chronological order, he has uh, introduced the subject. It was really awesome. I think I have no other word to tell. Because most of the things, especially the scientific part of it, or the physics of it, uh, as Peter but mentioned, uh, we have uh, uh, rather, I have come to know some of those things for the first time, as again Rangarajan and then our uh, Patmanavan sir and then our uh, Srinivasan sir and all have put it rightly. Uh, I have nothing more to add, but only one thing which I can say, I think, sir, you should continue to be uh, guide the uh, your club students because you are all the, uh, the, the source of knowledge to them, and we we'll all will definitely learn something uh, from you people. Okay, all the very best, and then happy New Year, and the, let the New Year uh, brings uh, uh, at least the uh, end to this pandemic. Okay, all the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sundarmar sir. Without taking Thank any you, more sir. time, Thank we you. are inviting our students and a lot of gifted students also join with us from Tirur uh, Education District and all over Kerala. And I invite Varun. And Varun will uh, introduce a few more things today. One is the feedback form in the a Google form is given to our participants. And at the same time, there is a quiz also from the topics already mentioned by or presented by Dr. George Jacob. Varun, uh, please come and uh, hand yes, in the Q&A session. Wonderful session. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so today, uh, I will uh, ask the questions. We, uh, there are two questions uh, what we, uh, which we collected from uh, the chat window, which was asked by the students, uh, student participants. Uh, so before moving to that, uh, uh, thank you, Jacob, sir, for a wonderful session. Uh, it was really interesting and uh, it was uh, like uh, what sir told in the chat window, it was touching all the aspects like the technical aspects and the uh, theoretical aspects of um, James Webb Telescope. It was really interesting. And uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, sharing this uh, uh, recorded video for few more participants uh, who is uh, not present, uh, regular participants uh, who could, couldn't attend today's session. Uh, so because it was uh, that much informative session, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful yeah. session, sir. So uh, let me move on to the uh, two questions, which I saw in the chat window. First one is asked by Adi Dev. He's a uh, fifth standard student from Coricor. Uh, and the question is, uh, so why does the integrated uh, science instrument module of the JWST have to be maintained at a temperature of six Kelvin for uh, it to take good photos? Yeah, uh, they, I mean, this uh, telescope is basically an infrared telescope. So the instruments, even if it is at a higher temperature, then it, it, in itself it will uh, radiate and the radiations will be uh, getting mingled with uh, um, the uh, original radiations expected from the object. So it will spoil the image. So the whole thing should be kept at a very low temperature so that the infrared emissions are, uh, are curtailed. So I, it will not interfere with uh, the original observations which are, uh, which are expected to be made uh, from uh, objects which are uh, in the universe. So for that purpose, we need to get it. Uh, so in infrared telescopes, usually uh, 
uh, there will be uh, in ground based telescopes there will be cooling mechanism which will be cooling the system but you know in space it is a uh, much cold if uh, the uh, solar radiations are not imaging on to this uh, any object then it is much cold so that advantage is being taken for a uh, uh, in the case of this infrared telescope and that advantage is uh, one of the uh, one of the expected uh, merits telescope to the cell orbit one of the merits okay, and also we mentioned the instrument will get saturated actually yeah yeah true true that's true yes so because this is uh, intended for uh, uh, the very faint of uh, the the radiations which are coming in it should not be so as to us sir was from our sir was mentioning it should not be saturating this uh, instrument so uh, we are, what we are expecting is a uh, radiations so very faint radiations from very far away objects so in order to have it detected we should avoid uh, bright objects uh, being interfering with the observation okay life expectancy i saw a uh, question regarding the life expectancy nasa has uh, um, uh, expecting it to be uh, um, for 5 years but it may go up to 10 years what is expected and uh, one another thing we should remember hubble was originally uh, meant for 15 years and now after 30 years it's still kicking with a very fantastic pictures uh, uh, photometric images and uh, spectroscopy being done so probably if you are lucky maybe the jwst may go further than 10 years but within 10 years it is capable of bringing in a revolution in astrophysics i uh, 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 if i uh, i think it will thank you sir uh, another question in the chat window is a general question uh, not just for uh, uh, this particular space telescope but uh, for uh, most of the uh, space missions uh, how do james webb telescope communicate with the scientists in earth yeah yeah i should have also mentioned that uh, thank you for pointing it out uh, there was a certain uh, uh, information regarding that which for the uh, for the purpose of brevity i have avoided that but there are telescopes three telescopes through uh, to which uh, the james webb telescope will be uh, communicating all the data which is collected will be aired uh, to these telescopes and there will be the ground facility where this uh, data will be processed and uh, maybe corrected for instrumental aspects or in instrumental parameters and finally the science data will be made available to the the scientific community for further exploration so but uh, I, as i have read from the nasa website uh, it is going to come only after 6 months or so because uh, after one month or so it will get fully deployed uh, in uh, l2 orbit but uh, initially there will be lots of uh, tests and checks which uh, the nasa want to do and the first light images are expected within 6 months thank you sir uh, so that was the uh, questions asked in the chat windows by the students uh, there was no uh, more questions but uh, i just want to mention one more thing uh, as a question sir uh, sir as a uh, executive member of astronomical society of india uh, how do you uh, uh, what's your uh, comment uh, on progress of astrophysics in india yeah varun thank you for asking uh, that question so first of all i should mention that uh, this is the 50th year of uh, astronomical society of india and i was fortunate to be a member of executive committee uh, i'm just uh, uh, maybe my time is over this year 2022 a new team is coming up but this year being a member of asi executive Com uh, council was uh, i i i think it as a uh, as a kind of luck for me or uh, maybe a privilege for me and uh, uh, you, uh, about your question there is a uh, lots of uh, research which is going on in astronomy and astrophysics and uh, this uh, is not just a statement but it is supported by the number of uh, young people who are attending the asi meetings which are held every year this year uh, the uh, the meeting is be, uh, to be held uh, in uh, iit roorkee uh, some sometime in february march and uh, maybe around 500 to 600 participants will be usually there almost 500 will be there and uh, over the years it was uh, it was seen that uh, it is observed that the number of youngsters are increasing and also i should say that the number of women scientists are also increasing so that is a very positive sign that uh, young population more of them are coming into so earlier it was like very few very few astronomers were there in india 
but now astronomy has become a very powerful branch of a uh, uh, maybe branch of physics i should say it's not exactly physics only but there is instrumentation engineering everything but uh, the science facts are coming from the physics so that has uh, evolved into a very important branch of uh, science so um uh, further uh, we also see that this is just an off comment we also see the certain unscientific ways in which some of the uh, uh, premier institutions in india are uh, uh, kind of uh, interpreting science i'm not going into the details uh, this is uh, i'm warning you youngsters who are here don't be hold, held away by such claims do do uh, have a faith in science and also do uh take something as a fact by testing it with science not with any claims so this is uh, with regard to a certain incident of a publication of a calendar by a premier institution in our country it will, it uh, i feel it to be very bad about the unscientific things which they have mentioned in it so sorry uh, this is all from the answer of the question but i just remembered that and i just wanted to tell you young people so varun did i answer your question uh, Uh, yes sir sure sir thank you sir thank you so much uh, thank you for answering my question and uh, i was blessed to attend this uh, session because uh, it was very really interesting and uh, as a person uh, i am also keen interested in astronomy i was following surendran uh, sir for uh, last 3 4 years uh, to study more and more about astronomy and i am uh, very happy that i uh, i could attend your session sir uh, sir uh, i just want to introduce uh, one more thing for the parts friends uh, about our uh, webinar strategy uh, this uh, from this year sessions uh, we are uh, we would like to uh, present a feedback form uh, after each webinar session uh, we will give a feedback form in the chat window uh, all of you all the all the participants can uh, fill that feedback form and you can mention about uh, the topics uh, which you will be interested to hear about uh, the, there's a column uh, in that google form for that and also uh, as i said before we will have the uh, quiz us space code quiz uh, session 43 uh, on james webb space telescope uh, the questions were given by dr joy uh, jacob sir uh, which is uh, related to the today's presentation uh, so all of you are requested to attend that quiz uh, after vote of thanks uh, at the time of vote of thanks i will uh, post the quiz link in the chat window uh, after this uh, session after the vote of thanks the uh, quiz link will be active all of you can access the quiz after that you can uh, access the feedback form because uh, the uh, uh, fastest and accurate answers will be considered for the prize in the quiz, uh, quiz competition so now uh, all of you are requested to attend the quiz first uh, and the, about the feedback form uh, we have sent the feedback form to all registered participants and the 71 uh, 71 registered participants uh, for this webinar session so we have sent uh, the feedback form to all 71 registered participants uh, so you can access the feedback from uh, uh, that your uh, the mail we have sent you uh, you can access through uh, that mail and uh, we will uh, once again uh, i request all of you to uh, attend the quiz competition and uh, If uh, sir, if time available, I have one more question to uh, Joy Jacob okay. sir. Okay, uh, ask it first. Sure, sure. Sir, uh, sir uh, can you uh, give us uh, some, uh, some more information about the particular constellation uh, uh, where uh, you are working for, uh, which is named as Saraswati constellation? Varun, uh, uh, it is not a constellation. It is actually a, a cluster of a super cluster oh, of galaxies. Sir. Constellation is uh, regarding stars. No, this is yes, much sir. beyond. so uh, you might remember in the in the hierarchical structure formation in the universe uh, there is a, if you look it from the side of planets uh, there are planets which are revolving around the uh, the the stars and stars are form part of the galaxy so galaxy is a structure stars are the building blocks of that and these galaxies are also not existing in uh, uh, some of the galaxies are uh, uh, existing as uh, as uh, itself but the other galaxies some of them club together or uh, they show a, a nature of a, a nature of a, a clubbing together so we have a galaxy groups and clusters we know that our own galaxy group is called the local group probably you may be knowing that about 54 galaxies are there so these galaxy groups are there or clusters are there larger groups are known as clusters and these galaxy clusters they also tend to uh, uh, tend to form structures further 
uh, hierarchically higher structures, which are called uh, galaxy superclusters. And uh, we are a part of uh, Laniaca galaxy supercluster, as uh, you can learn it from uh, the website, or probably you might have already read about that. Like that, uh, a few other uh, superclusters are uh, identified, maybe around 10 or less than that. And ours, uh, the Saraswati supercluster, uh, which is uh, all, like uh, 4 billion uh, light years away, uh, was uh, discovered uh, in 2017 from uh, the STSS data. There is uh, this slow and digital sky survey. Uh, in fact, uh, people usually ask whether we have uh, we have observed uh, this uh, supercluster. No, we didn't. Actually, it is uh, actually from uh, the um, from the STSS data we have uh, found that there is a supercluster there. So this uh, image was already there, but people did not uh, kind of explore it, and th that's why probably they might have missed it. But we were able to get it uh, with. Uh, the effort of uh, Shishir Shankian, our group member and the research scholar, who did uh, most of the work. And uh, the rest of us, uh, five of us, were, were, were also another student, Pratik Tapade. And uh, other than that, uh, there was a one, uh, uh, one uh, um, uh, postdoc fellow. And then there were uh, myself and uh, other faculty members from uh, uh, Ayuka. Um, and director of the Ayuka was also involved. So mostly our role was to help him and also to discuss and uh, direct him what what is to be done and all. He has developed uh, an algorithm by which he tested uh, the uh, this particular image and uh, uh, with uh, almost like five years of effort, he has uh, uh, finally uh, found it to be a supercluster and uh, we communicated it to Apche Journal and it was accepted and it was also aired all uh, as a science news all over the world uh, during 2017, uh, as a, a group of Indian scientists discovered uh, uh, the uh, cluster of galaxies. So we are actually proud to say that uh, we were uh, altogether six Indians who were a part of that uh, particular. Why I am telling this is mostly, uh, that is usual, but I'm not telling this is something very superb and all, but uh, this shows some sort of uh, our own pride that uh, maybe without uh, the interference without the participation or collaboration of uh, uh, other scientists from uh, from other countries we were able to bring out this so i'm not telling that collaboration is bad always uh, in science collaboration is very good but uh, see uh, this shows our capability maybe this will be uh, some sort of a depiction of uh, our capability to the young population young uh, science, science uh, savvy students population maybe thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I request all your support and guidance for the U.S. Space Club Amateur Astronomy Platform named as Sky Safari. There's a group called Sky Safari, which was mentioned by Shadil, sir, uh, at the starting of uh, today's session. Uh, we are working uh, daily uh, on astronomy. Uh, like, uh, there are a uh, lot of students interested in astrophotography. Uh, yesterday also, uh, we have made a uh, Mercury challenge uh, because students have told us uh, uh, today uh, Mercury will be the uh, at the highest point, so uh, it will be uh, easier to capture. Not easier to capture, it will be a better day to capture Mercury. So we conducted a Mercury challenge in the Sky Safari platform. And uh, for, uh, we request all your support and guidance for Sky Safari programs. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, being uh, with us and uh, sharing your uh, ideas and uh, know, helping us to know more about uh, James Six Space Telescope. Thank you, sir. Shall we start you? Yes, uh, I think it's a it's a good start in 2022 because with the interesting talk and an interaction. So all the veterans and the students accepted this talk in a very wholehearted way. And uh, we think that we'll continue this uh, talk, monthly talk in every second Saturdays with these wonderful questions and question answers and this kind of discussion. This is a forum for our students. Really, it's an environment for the students and we, for the nurturing, those who are the and we will invite all the students again to this forum uh, and we are in search of the students who are uh, so fond of the science and especially physics chemistry like that and we are planning some more stem based uh, talks on this platform and we have Ike Kutisar here and now he is uh, not able to uh, interact with us but he is still here and he is the founder of this UL Space Club and he will, uh, he will talk to us in the next session, coming sessions, and uh, I request uh, Dr. George Jacob and all the veterans here to support this program by providing a few more interesting talks, speakers, and uh, new ideas for 
uh, nurturing our students that we are demanding from you sir <laughs> humbly demanding from you sir uh, thank you sir we'll surely will do thank you, sir. Thank no, you. i'm only happy to do thank that you. Thank yeah you, and uh, thank you shajil sir for uh, giving me this opportunity yes, uh, to uh, interact with yes, sir, thank you and also i'm much, much happy that uh, many senior scientists are also attending and uh, i'm thankful to the encouragement given by them for me uh, much younger to them maybe uh, with all their uh, expertise and their uh, opinions are uh, much uh, uh, giving much confidence or uh, uh, much encouraging to me thank you all and also uh, nikhil thank you for your presence uh, thank you sir I'm we are we are really coming to the conclusion really we have a formal vote of thanks yeah. session that will be done by manasa is okay sir okay. manasa yeah. uh, please come forward to express vote of thanks on behalf of your space club manasa manasa are you are you there damare sir is not there okay then i take that opportunity without any time yes, sir okay sir nyana ah, okay sir okay sir, sir damare sir please please say i couldn't see you okay, okay. welcome sir damare sir is the okay, okay. Uh, coordinator of the ul uh, ul education program there is a, some four activities are happening uh, under the umbrella of ul space club uh, that is ntsc national talent search examination training is uh, done by this group and some more uh, stem based training for higher education also and these are the nurturing activities he is a former educational officer from government of kerala damodar sir welcome for to make his the uh, official vote of thanks from on behalf of you all okay thank you a very nice good afternoon to everybody on behalf of ulccs foundation i extend heartfelt thanks to one and the very persons participated in this program 43rd webinar conducted by UL Space Club, which is functioning under the umbrella of UL CCS Foundation. And we are proud, and it's a matter of pride, that we have conducted a series of 43 webinars during this pandemic. At the time when all the world stands still in front of the pandemic, our students and teachers especially master varun and shadil master under the leadership of kutti sir made use of this opportunity and found a way imparting space knowledge to curious students in that way of webinars and made associated with the eminent scientists professors scholars etc like bhattu sir rangarajan sir Ranganathan sir, Patmanavan sir, Jodhibal sir, Nikhil Mugandhan sir, and so on. Today, we have Dr. Joy Jacob with us and gave a brilliant speech on JWST and other telescopes, which was very worthy of hearing, brought a lot of information about the functioning of different types of telescopes and the origin of the universe and like that. I extend our severe, sincere gratitude to Dr. Joy Jacob for delivering a splendid speech and giving some messages to the young people that enlightens the importance of scientific thinking. I think I thank you, sir, once again. Okay. I thank all the veterans. who joined in our program and they are the webinar family for being with us in this evening i thank you once again thank you all again and they and they expect expecting whole hearted cooperation i thank all the students parents and all other participants i must thank the persons who worked behind the program to be a success thank you all again hey sir the uh, quizling has been shared in the uh, chat window also the feedback